He is amazing and he is awesome. Well, good Friday evening to you all. This evening we're going to commemorate the, the death of Christ. We're going to remember what he did because the reality is, is we would not be able to sing and to experience the joy and the freedom and the peace that we do had he not made the right decision to obey his father completely. And so we give the Lord thanks for that, and we're glad that you're here. Would you just uh, greet uh, people and just give them a, a blessing? And uh, to all of you who are online in our online community, we want to welcome you. We want to thank you for joining us for this Good Friday service. In just a moment, we are going to receive communion. We're going to receive communion, and this is what I want you to know, that this is the most important week in the Christian calendar. And you know what I believe and understand, and I've been saying this now for the last couple of weeks privately and a time or two publicly, but this celebration is God's idea. It was God who says, I want you to mark the calendar. And in this season of Passover, I want you to remember. I want you to celebrate. Well, this is an important week for us. And it, and it began on last Sunday with the triumphal entry, his prayer in the garden, his arrest, the trial and the crucifixion. And let me just tell you something. God is absolutely amazing. This was the most brilliant plan ever conceived. And the foundation of this plan is love. And the goal of God's great plan was redemption. His goal was to bring us into union and communion with him. This is an amazing God because this God chose to pursue us who are not worthy to be pursued. He chose to pardon us who were not deserving of a pardon. He chose to redeem us who had no intrinsic worth, no value disconnected from him, but he is merciful. Can you say the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever? So let's talk about the crucifixion timeline. So about midnight last night, Jesus sweated great drops of blood in the garden, trying to come to this will, come to this conclusion, God, is this your will? And why was there such a wrestling on his part? He loved God and he wanted to obey God, but he was weighing out the consequence because for him to take our sins upon himself, it meant that he would be separated from his father, and that had never happened in all of eternity. This is what the wrestling is about. God, do I have to take their sins? Because you know what that means. You know that means we're going to be separated. You know that means that, that your wrath is going to be poured out in full force on me. Have you ever been in a situation where somebody you love said something ugly to you and it really cuts you to the core? You said, how dare you say that or how could you say that to me? Or you did something on your job and, and you were a, a, a star employee, a stellar employee doing everything that you're supposed to do. And then when the time for the recognition or the raise of the promotion came, they didn't and it cut you to the core. See, we've experienced some pain, but here's what I can tell you. We have never experienced the pain that Jesus Christ experienced when his father said, you're not my son. So he wrestled in the garden. And then about 1 a.m., Judas comes into the garden and he's betrayed. And then for the next six hours, he is tried by the religious group. He's tried by the Roman government. And then the people who just a few days earlier were saying, Hosanna, save us. Son of David, have mercy upon us. Those people who are crying out, we're going to make you king, were the ones who began to shout, crucify him, crucify him. And after the trial and after the inspection, they couldn't find any blame. So basically, they accused him of insurrection, accused him of trying to overthrow the government. And then at 9 a.m. today, at 9 a.m., he hung on the cross, stretched out. And he hangs on that cross in agony and in pain and in suffering. And he does from 9 to noon and about noon o'clock, the earth begins to respond 
to what is happening. And the scripture says that the sun refused to shine. The earth begins to rebel because the earth recognizes the king of glory. But those, his highest creation in the earth, don't. And then at two o'clock, here's what he declares, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me? Why have you disowned me? Because that's what that word forsaken means. It means that the father looked at him and he had our sins upon himself. And the father said, you're not my son. Can I submit to you all that I love my dad? My dad is a superhero in my eyes. And if my dad ever said to me, Ricky, you don't belong to me. I disown you. It would have ripped my hearts to shred. But he was being disowned for us. My God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Why are you turning your back on me? And he's thinking in his mind what he heard when he went into the waters of baptism. And when he came up out of the water, the scripture records that a voice said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. But on the cross, he's saying, I don't own you. You're not my son. He's thinking about in the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter, James, and John is there and the glory of God shows up and Elijah and Moses shows up and the, the voice comes and the Father says in that moment, this is my son, hear him. But not at two o'clock. What he's hearing is, you're not my son and I'm so distraught and angry with you and the wrath of God began to pour out on him because our sins, my sin, your sin was on him. He who knew no sin was made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God. Oh, we're thinking now, about this, and at three o'clock he says, Father, after all of this, this brutality of being beaten mercilessly, after hearing his father reject him, he still says these words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He is still in a place of trust. He is still in a place of honor. He is still in a place of believing that he will see the goodness of God. And at five o'clock, a couple hours ago, he's now in the tomb. He's been overcome by death. Why? Because God said to Adam and Eve, the day that you partake of the fruit, that is the day you will die. And so the wages of sin is death. And wherever you see death, you know that sin has risen its ugly head to make a difference. So when you walk in sickness, just recognize that's the effects of the sin from the garden. When you are struggling in your mind to put two thoughts together, understand that that is sin from the garden. It is death at work. When you have relationships that are, are estranged and there's intensity and there's insecurity and there's pain, that is the sting of death at work. And because he took his sins upon us, then that death overcame him. We live in a culture now where the people say there's no such thing as sin. I can create my own reality and my own truth. I submit to you that truth is not subjective. Truth is not a feeling. Truth is an individual, and that individual is Jesus Christ who says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. I am what is real. But let me tell you, for this moment, death had its grip on him, and he was put in the grave. So we celebrate the resurrection on Sunday, but tonight we remember the pain and the process 
And this Easter parallels with the Jewish Passover. And the Jewish Passover, the lamb was slain. And unfortunately, the lamb who was an animal could not cover the sins once and for all for, human, for humanity. When they slew the lamb in the ceremonial ritual of the Passover, they took the blood of the lamb and they put it on the doorpost. And what it did was it provided protection that night. But the lamb that was slain in the first Passover when Israel was in Egypt, that lamb that was slain was a type of the Lamb of God that would be slain. And just like them posting blood over the doorpost, here's what we have to do. We have to post the blood of Jesus over our lives so that the destroyer, so death, passes over us. And so when God says to Moses, I'm going to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, I'm going to bring them out with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he gave them promises. And we read about those four promises. We call those the four promises. They're called the cup of blessing. And let me give you just some background on that. So God did exactly what he told Moses. And here's what we read about in Exodus, the sixth chapter, verse six. It says, therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out. Everybody say, bring you out. From under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rescue you from their bondage. Everybody say, I will rescue you. And I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. Say, I will redeem you. And I will take you as my people. Say, I will take you as my people. And I will be your God. And then you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brings you out from under the burden of the Egyptians and I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. So he says, I will bring you out. I will rescue you. I will redeem you. I will take you as my people. And God did exactly what he told Moses he would do. And so after the first Passover, God instructed the people to remember this time, to remember this season, to remember this moment when God brought you out because you slew a lamb and you put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost of your house and the lamb of God saved them from death. The lamb of God saved them from death. It was amazing. And so now here's what happens during the Passover season. In the celebration of Passover, there is a meal called the Seder. And in the Seder, the Seder, which means in the Hebrew order, there is a meal and there are four cups of wine that are associated with this particular passage of Scripture. Four promises that God made to Moses and the children of Israel. And though those promises were made more than 3,500 years ago, those same promises are available to you today. Why? Because the Passover, the first Passover, the original Passover, was a type of what we experienced when Jesus Christ came. Let me also say this, just as something to really know, that that night, the first Passover, not all of the Hebrews came out of Israel, out of Egypt. Do you know why? Because if you didn't believe the instruction that Moses gave and you didn't put the blood on the doorpost, the death angel visited your house that night and you lost a child. And let me tell you something, there were those who were not Hebrews who heard the instruction to slay a lamb and put the blood over the doorpost, and those people were spared the angel killing, the death angel killing their kids. And let me tell you what that is indicative of is this, is that salvation belongs to whosoever will. That salvation's invitation is to everybody, to any and everyone. No one's excluded. But the way is exclusive and the way is Jesus Christ. So he says this, I will bring you out. And in the Seder, they call that the cup of sanctification. In Titus, he talks about how uh, we are sanctified by God. So listen to this, Titus, the third chapter, verse 3. It wasn't long ago that we ourselves were stupid and stubborn, 
dupes of sin. Don't you like how the message does that? Just makes it very practical, just like we can understand it. Ordered every way, which way by our glands going around with a chip on our shoulder, hated and hating back. But when God, our kind and loving Savior, God, stepped in, he saved us from all that. It was all his doing. We had nothing to do with it. He gave us a good bath, and we came out of it new people, washed inside and out by the Holy Spirit. Our Savior Jesus poured out new life so generously. God's gift has restored our relationship with him and given us back our lives. And there's more life to come, an eternity of life. You can count on this. So he gives us this cup of sanctification, which is the cup of salvation. Let me tell you that God wants everyone saved. The scripture says this, that he wants everyone to be saved. He does not want any to perish. And God has made a way for you. He's made a way for me. He has made a way for the world. Salvation in its truest context means this, to to be in a constricted place. And salvation means this, to step through an entryway and come into a broad and open space, a space where you can run, where you can know God, where you can experience his presence. It reminds me of a video I saw this week that this horse apparently had been locked in a stall for quite some time. And when they were getting ready to put it out in an open pasture, they came through the gate and the horse just began to just go crazy, just began to buck. And the, and the person who had the, the, uh, the uh, rope, they were trying to just contain them until they could get the rope off. And once they took that rope off, took the bridle off, that horse, boom, he just sprinted across the field. Just so happy to be just so free. And here's what I'm going to tell you, that when you come to know God, when you come to this place of salvation, God's going to bring you into a broad and open place, and that which you have not known, you will begin to experience like never before. But here's what I want you to know that Jesus said in John 6, no man can come to the Father unless the Father who sent me draws him. It becomes vitally important that you do not ignore the invitation when Jesus says, come. Revelation 3, he says, I stand at the door and knock, and if you will open the door, I will come in and have a meal with you. You see, we think Christianity and we think salvation is about rules, about do's and don'ts, but at the end of the day, it's pure relationship. And accepting God's promise of relationship is the way that we come to know God because Jesus hung on that cross so that could become a reality for us. The second cup, we call it the cup of deliverance. He says, I will free you. Paul writes in Romans, the seventh chapter, he says, so then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. I'm going to tell you that when Christ sets you free, one of the places that he begins to set you free is in your mind. The word says this in Romans 12, 2. It says this, do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed, be made into something altogether new and different by the renewing of your mind. The scientists are now saying they used to think that brain cells, when they die, they couldn't be regenerated. But the people who study the brain now recognize that the brain is constantly rebuilding itself. And you know what it's rebuilding itself with? It's rebuilding itself based upon your thoughts. I've learned this from an athletic standpoint, trying to help my boys to become the best athletes they can. And I recognize that you go to the top, whether it's in athletics or whether it's on your job or whether it's becoming a good husband or a good wife or a good friend, based upon what you have in your mind. Here's what they have determined, that your mind your thoughts materialize in your mind. So when you begin to think, I am a champion, the brain begins to formulate the proteins that then injects these proteins in your body that make you act and think like a champion. God knew what he was talking about when he challenged us to be renewed in our mind. And what did Paul say? By the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, we've been set free. Ephesians 4, listen to what Paul writes. He says, with the Lord's authority, I say this. Listen to this challenge. This is to believers. 
Live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly, hopelessly confused. Why are they confused? Their minds are full of darkness. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives them because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. Do you look at that word heart? You know heart has two things in it. It has here. Here is one of those things that's in it. So a heart and the hearing are connected. What you hear with your ears will eventually seep into your heart. And this is why this morning in our prayer, we declare the Tejada Declaration. I call it the Tejada Declaration, but we've sent it out to hundreds of people. And we say, you name it, whatever you want to name it. Name it your family. But it starts with this. We will not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of the sinner, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But our delight is in your word. And in your word, we meditate day and night. We shall be like trees planted by the rivers of living water will bring forth our fruit in its season and our leaves will not wither and whatever we do will prosper. My God, if you start remembering and memorizing the word and then putting it to action with your mouth, it's going to bring transformation. God says, I will free you. And here's a true statement. If you can get free in your mind, you will always, always, Be free no matter the physical circumstances around you. You wonder how people who find themselves in dire situations, how do they make it out of the most strenuous, the most stressful of situations? It's because they got their mind right. Now, if we can do that as natural human beings, what can we do when the Spirit of God, with the Word of God circulating, meditating in our mind, what are the things that we can accomplish? There is nothing we can't accomplish when we get our mind right. Why? Because God wants us free. Jesus came to set us free. His death, his burial, his resurrection made it possible for us to find freedom. Everybody say, I'm free. You're free because he hung on the cross. That's where the freedom always starts. I love the old song we used to sing at Second Evening Star Missionary Baptist Church. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Come on, somebody. It's at the cross. We we don't get to knowing God except there's a cross. We don't get to a place of finding freedom except but for the cross. Here's a third promise. I will redeem you. We call it the cup of redemption, Ephesians 1. Verse 11, here's the message again. It's in Christ that we find out who we are. Oh, so many people are trying to figure out who they are. They want to identify who they are based upon the color of their skin. They want to identify who they are based upon the size of their bank account. They want to identify who they are based upon their sexuality or their gender. I'm going to tell you the place where you find out who you are is in Christ. He says it's in Christ that we find out who we are. Our identity has to be found in Christ. And we talked about this in our series this this month, that our identity, we have been created in the image of Almighty God. And our purpose is to display his glory for all the world to see. Come on. If you find your identity outside anything other than Christ, then you're short selling yourself. You're shortchanging yourself. You're living a life less than God intended for you to live. Here's what Paul says. Here's what he says. This is the word. Don't get mad at me. It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we are living for. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us. Mm. My God. I just might just start running around the stage right now, but then like 20% of y'all will stop watching us. They say they're not dignified enough in that church. So I'm gonna just, I'm gonna act dignified here and I'll get my praise on uh, later on tonight when I get, how about that? I just, I'm, 
Don't y'all mess with me. I, I might just get my praise on right now. Listen to what he said. Uh-oh, they're going to get the... Do we have a B3? If we have a B3, it might get crazy in here. I don't know how to do that. What y'all say? Let, let's go on because we, we, we want to get to communion. Long before we first heard of Christ and got our hopes up, he had his eye on us, had designs on us for glorious living, part of the overall purpose he is working out in everything and everyone. Let me tell you something. I love to use this word. I don't know if it's an old school word or not. Do anybody use smitten? Dude, I know the young people don't know what smitten means. Let me just tell you what smitten means. It means you got a ring in your nose, and whoever you are smitten by, they can just lead you around, just get you just running just all over the place. Go right, go left, go back, go forward. See, I'm like that with, I'm smitten by Sid. Sid got me, guys. Sid got my money. Sid's got my time. Sid got everything I got. Now, I know how much I love her, but let me tell you something about how much God loves you. He loved you before he ever created the world. His love for you happened before there was ever a you. So you think now you're doing something stupid, you're going to make him turn his back on you? You know, I've said this about the relationship. We've treated God so bad. If God went and got advice, you know what the... You know what his best friend advice to him would be? Man, you need to leave them people alone. They ain't good for you. And God says, I can't help myself. I can't help myself. I need you and nobody else. I know I didn't, my wife's going to get me because one thing she wants, if I'm going to sing, you better be on key. And the problem is, I don't even know what keys are. That's just, so, so I just plead ignorant. Let me move on. Do you know who you are? Do you know what you're living for? It's impossible to truly answer those two questions without knowing the God who created you. See, he, he's a manufacturer, and every time there's a manufacturer of a product, when they make that product, that product comes with specific instructions. Our manual is the scripture. That's our instruction book. God made us, he knows all about us, and he made us to reflect his glory. Now, we talked about this on Sunday. We have no light in us if we have no relationship with him. We have no light in us if we have no relationship with him. And what did we talk about this whole month? Sin blinds us to our purpose. What is the purpose? Our reason for existing. God sent Jesus to the cross to die for our sins. And as we know God and as we find freedom it becomes very easy to discover our purpose because we're connected to the one who made us. But here's the reality. There's no discovering your purpose except he stretched out his arms, except he was beaten, except he was rejected and disowned by his own dead. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all the day. Last point, last point. Here's the, here's the fourth cup. He says, I will take you as my own people. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Now, let me just tell y'all something. So I talk about my experience with losing my first wife. First of all, my wife is very comfortable with us talking about that. When I met Sid, here's what she said. Honey, I can't, I can't discard 15 years of your life. She says, but what I see happen, she said this. She said, your, your first wife, Deborah, y'all are running in the race, the race God appointed. And then she handed the baton to God. And then God began to run with me for a season, and we were rolling. And then God said, I got something for my boy, Rick. Whew. He handed the baton to Sid. It's a continuous race. 
And so when I talk about what happened, I'm just telling you, it's almost in my life like the Apostle Paul. I was on the road to Damascus and this happened. When Paul began to talk about the life-defining moments in his life, I learned so many lessons during that season. They made, they put some things in me. So here's, here's, after, here's a story. After my first wife transitioned to heaven, her own mom said this, Ricky, you're going to get married again and it won't be long. And I was appalled. I was, I was appalled, and I said, that's never going to happen. In fact, I thought I would never get married again because I love my first wife hard. And then I, be, very best friend, Richard and Becky Pierce, who were like parents to me and Deborah, they said the same thing. Becky, shortly after Deborah's death, here's what she said. You're going to get married within, the, and it won't take long. And I said, I'm not getting married. And then she pointed her finger at me. She said, you just wait and see. You'll be married within two years. And I said, what makes you say that? And she said this, you had a good marriage. And when you have a good marriage, you're not afraid to make commitment to another. Then God did a number on me. And he sent me this little masterpiece called Sid. She surfaced eight months after Deborah's death. And eight months after her name surfaced, she was walking up that aisle. It happened quick. And in a week from Sunday, my girl and I are going to celebrate 23 years together. 23! In fact, it was Easter weekend when we got married. And I'm thinking about that now. I, I'm, I'm, I did Pastor Mike number this service, me and said, we got married on Easter weekend. What were we thinking? We weren't, except about us. <laughs> All the church stuff going on, and we're going to throw a big old wedding on Easter weekend. But let me ask you this question. When he says this, that he is going to bring us into this relationship. What kind of value are you going to put on your relationship? You know, if somebody said to me, hey, your whole family, Sid, Seth, Caleb, and your mother-in-law, Mom, Eula, I'll give you $10 billion if you just kick them to the curb and go live life on your own. You know what I'm going to tell them? Take that 10. You know where you can stick it. I will take you as my own people. I will take you as my own people. What value do you put on relationship? You see, when we come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, he takes us to a place we would have never gone, allows us to experience things we would have never known and comforts us in ways where we never feel alone. Now, if I had to just did that a little bit faster, you be calling me Jesse Jackson right now because that rhyme. So I'm going to say it again. His love, can I say it like him? I don't know if y'all like Jesse Jackson. It doesn't make any difference. I'm going to just, I'm imitating the man, okay? His love for us, his love for and in us moves us to a place that we want others to experience him in the same way we have. That's the wrong thing, man. Back that thing back down. <laughs> I'm messing up now. When we come into relationship with God through Jesus Christ, he takes us to places we would have never gone, allows us to experience things we would have never known, satisfies and comforts us in ways we never feel alone. See, there we go right there. That's the rhyme. Now, you're, you're missing my point because I'm acting so silly right now in what is a very serious time. His love for and in us moves us to a place that we want others to experience him in the same way. And I'm going to tell you, none of this would have happened without the cross. He wants us to discover our purpose so that we can then make a difference. In closing, here's what I want you to know. The cross and his death secured our freedom to experience and become all he has created us to be. Ephesians 2 sums it up. And here's what it says. For we are his masterpiece we are God's masterpiece he has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us a long time ago so what is it that he brings what are those four cups it's a cup of sanctification which is salvation the 
cup of deliverance, which is freedom, the cup of redemption, which is restoration, and the cup of praise, which is fulfillment. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and we worship you. Lord, things are going to get really good here when we celebrate the resurrection, Jesus' resurrection. But Lord, tonight we remember the cross. We remember the pain. We remember the suffering. We remember the promise. And God, we just thank you. We thank you, Lord God, that you made a way for us. We thank you, God, that when he said it is done, it is finished, the veil in the temple tore in two. And it was indicative of how you wanted, Lord, not to be contained in a box, not contained behind a veil, but God, you would come into relationship with us. That relationship, that freedom, that sanctification would not be known without the cross. And we thank you in Jesus' name. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to receive communion right now. I want us to, if you have your communion elements, let's stand. And if you don't have your communion elements, we have our dream teamers are ready. Just ra- wave your hand. In the online community, if you want to partake in this with us, then grab you some bread or some juice, crackers or some wine, a soda, whatever it is, because we're going to honor the Lord. And before we do, here's what I want to do. I want to take care of some business because what we're about to do, this is a ritual that here's what Jesus did on the night that he was betrayed he took the bread and he blessed it he took the cup of wine and he blessed it and he says here's what I want y'all to do he says and I'll talk about in a few minutes what the symbolism was but he said this he says when you come together and you partake of the bread and the cup he says do it in my remembrance remember me so if you're new to Christianity, this is, this is something that we've done to reflect on what Christ has done for thousands of years since the first church was birthed in the book of Acts. There's been communion. There's been reflecting on what Jesus did. There's been a celebration of his resurrection. So here's what I'm going to tell you, that this cup is not for you if you have not made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. And if you have made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, but you are away from him, then then you shouldn't partake of this cup. We're not trying to be exclusive, but this is a sacred moment. This is a holy moment. But pastor, I feel like I really connected here tonight. So, so can I partake? Yes, we're gonna lead you into a prayer, what we call a prayer of salvation, where you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord, you repent of your sin, tell God you're sorry, and that qualifies you to take the cup. Well, you mean I don't have to do like 20 weeks of good deeds? No. All you have to do is believe because the word says this, that with if we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we'd be saved. Salvation is not works-based. It's based upon faith. God gives a promise. You say yes, and then you start the journey. So it's not a one-time experience either. It's a lifetime of experiencing and working with God. Okay? If you are away from God, then what you need to do is when we pray, you just need to say, God, I'm sorry, I'm coming home. God, I'm getting off the detour. You know he's not mad at you. And he's not looking to make you grovel on your knees for 200 yards. You know why? Because he poured all of his anger out on Christ. He's not mad. His anger, his wrath was satisfied when Jesus hung on the cross. He's not mad at you. This is why you can come to him. I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care what you have done. There is nothing you've ever done. What if I killed somebody? There's still mercy. What if I abandoned my family? There's still mercy. So let's pray. In fact, let's do this. I want you to just close your eyes and bow your head in the online community. Here's what I want you to do. And right here in this sanctuary, I want you to acknowledge 
that you need to make it right with God. It's not, it's a big deal if you don't, and it's a big deal if you do. But there's consequences for both. So here's what I want you to do. If you say, Pastor, I need to make it right with God, I want you to just raise your hand right now. Come on, yes, ma'am, I see your hand. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am. I see your hand, yes, sir. Who else? All up in the balcony, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, who else? In the back balcony, anybody in the back? I see over in the corner of the balcony. Yes, ma'am, yes, I see your hand. All over this building, where else? Come on, just put your hand up, just acknowledge the Lord. I see your hand. Just put it up right now. Yes, I see your hand. I see your hand. Yes, ma'am. I see families raising their hands. That's awesome. And that's whether you want to come to Christ or whether you're repenting and you're getting back in line with him. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to say this prayer. Repeat this after me. In the online community, click that raise your hand button. Click that button. And and I want you to, to sing. I want you to say this with me. I want you to say this prayer. Covenant, let's join in with, in with them. Say this. Say, Heavenly Father. I come to you now and I thank you for sending your son to take my place on the cross. It should have been me. I am the sinner. He wasn't the sinner, but he took my place. I believe that Jesus is the son of God. I believe that you raised him from the dead. I'm repenting now of my sin I'm turning my back on it and I'm running straight to you I'm running straight to Jesus Jesus come into my life and let's do life together I commit myself to you right now and I thank you for forgiving me and for loving me and for saving me in Jesus name amen Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand for all of those who made a decision. Now, there's a couple of things that I want you to do. After we close out the service, if you're in the online community, text I am saved to 41411. I am saved to 41411. And here's what I want you to do if you're in the sanctuary. What I want you to do is that when they start singing, I want you, if you raise your hand, just make your way right down here to the altar. And we're going to greet you. And we've got team members who are here to just support you and to love you. Now, it's going to take courage. But here's what I'm going to tell you. When you take that step, I believe things are going to begin to change. Because faith always requires a response. And when we start singing, that's when you start moving, okay? Let's take this, uh, let's receive this communion. Take out your wafer now. It's unleavened, which means there's no sin. That's what they did in the first Passover, and the Passover was after. And Jesus took the bread, and he blessed the bread. He gave God thanks, and he says, this bread is representative of my body that is going to be broken for you. And when his body was broken, the power of the presence of God in his life was released, just like the power of the seed is released when it goes into the ground and it's buried. The power that's contained in the seed is released. So God's life was released to us. Father, we thank you for this bread and we receive it now in Jesus' name in remembrance of his death. Then he took the cup and he had to have the cup because the cup is representative of the new covenant. Under the old covenant, you did not have the power to serve God. You did not have the power to live a righteous life, a holy life. Sin was at work against you, but he destroyed sin and death. And he says, this cup is the, is the cup of the new covenant. And here's what Jeremiah said. He's going to write his law on your heart. And what is that law? It's the law of love, that you fall so in love with him that temptation and sin does not get the best of you. That you have the ability to love him and to love each other. It's a powerful experience. And he says this. He says, this cup is representative of my blood. Because without the shedding of blood, sins cannot be forgiven. We saying just one drop would have been enough. He had to shed his blood to provide covering for us. And so as we drink this cup, remember this, you're free. So act like it. Remember when you drink this cup that you are whole. So receive your healing. 
when you drink this cup, remember that he took those crown of thorns on his head so that you could have clarity of mind and thought and depression and oppression had no place in you. When you drink this cup, receive the provision that the blood of Christ has purchased for you. You have been redeemed from the curse of the law. You have been redeemed. Come on, let's just say that right now. I have been redeemed from the curse of the law. I have been redeemed from the curse of the law. I have been redeemed from the curse of the law. So wherever death is, wherever sickness is, that's the curse of the law at work. That doesn't mean you're a bad person. We're just in a corrupt system and we need the blood of Jesus to wash us. We need the blood of Jesus to cleanse us because if you stepped into heaven right now, there would be no sickness, there would be no disease, there would be no lack, there would be no poverty. If you stepped into heaven right now, there would be no depression. So let's just, come on, let's just call heaven down right now. He said this, pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done in the earth just like it is in heaven. Father, we thank you that healing is available, that freedom is available, that salvation is available in the name of Jesus Christ. And we bless you and thank you and remember you for shedding your blood in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's drink to life. And for those of you who raised your hand, begin to make your way down to the altar right now. Hallelujah. Come on down. Thank you, Jesus.